dismissed to Children's Church, three to six. Age three to six. Let's see if we got some young ones here that aren't sick. All right, we're going to be in Acts chapter number nine today. Acts chapter number nine. We're going to talk about keep moving forward. Church, if there's anything we need to do, it's to stop quitting and to start going. Time to keep on the move. I want you to realize this today, if you have not understood this in the past, the devil would like nothing more than to get you to quit. The devil would like nothing more than to get you to sit down and just go, I'm done. It's time for somebody else to do it. You hear that a lot from older saints, but listen to me, older saints, you're not dead, you're not done. When you're done, God will put you in the bed or God will just go ahead and take you home. Until then, you're not done. And we are living in a day where we desperately need some older saints of God to teach the younger saints of God what to do and how to do it, right? This world is going to tell you a false thing, and we, we need to stop and make sure we're listening to the Spirit of God, and we're in the Word of God getting the direction. Now today, as we talk about keeping moving forward, I'm going to go into the book of Acts chapter number 9. Now this chapter... Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, this deals with the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, and then he, uh, obviously he's going to become the Apostle Paul. God didn't just save him, God changed him, right? By the way, if you're here today and you're saved, you're not just saved, you're changed. You're a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away, all things become new. But if you read Acts chapter number 9, uh, you're going to find some very interesting things. First of all, Saul is going about yet breathing out destruction. I mean, uh, he's breathing out threats. He's destroying the church. He's casting people into prison. He's having people killed because they believe in Jesus. And then all of a sudden, there in the middle of the road, the Lord impacts his life. I mean, in a very special way. I would have to say most of us in the church today, we don't have that kind of a conversion, do we? Where the Lord just, I mean, and then he was blind and had to be led around. But there's a very interesting statement made in verse number 20. Is that straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues and he is the Son of God. By the way, if you are a new creature in Christ and you are saved, old things do pass away, all things become new. There's going to be a new message that you have. And straightway, when you get saved, straightway, you're going to tell somebody about Jesus. And I want you to know if there's, some, if there's a reason you're not telling people about Jesus, it's not that God isn't leading you to do that. Because God tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He tells us to go forth. And so if we're not telling people about Jesus, if we're not trying to, and by the way, we're not trying to win people to our church. It's not about getting more people to sit in Shenandoah Heights Baptist Church. That's up to God where people go. Amen. We want to make sure we see them in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And if we keep the gospel the forefront, God will take care of that. I'm a firm believer. You tell people how to get to Jesus, Jesus will tell people how to get to our church. Right. Amen? Nevertheless, we're to go into the world. We're to preach the gospel. Tell people about Jesus. And if we're not doing it, it's because we have not been faithful. It's because we're not doing our part. Does everybody understand that? Now, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just trying to just let you know. Uh, let's get real. Let's get honest. Uh, it's not because you don't talk well. It's not because you don't have opportunities. It's not because you're not geared that way. Uh, you're a new creature in Christ. And the Holy Spirit in you is very much geared that way. It's just because we choose not to, okay? But I want you to realize today you can change. On this day can be a day when you stop sitting on the premises. You start standing on the promises. You stop just willy-nilly. And you get about the Father's business. And it's all about going forward. Let's begin reading verse number 23 uh, down to verse number 29 today. Verse number 23, this is about Paul's escape to Jerusalem after that he has become um, the Apostle Paul here now. And we're seeing him in his ministry and doing, doing some of his work already. And I'm trying to break this little contraption. I don't want to break this little contraption. Right, here we go. Verse number 23. And after that, many days were fulfilled. After what? After the fact that straightway he preached the gospel, and all that heard him were amazed, and he increased the more. People started to understand that there was something different about Paul. 
something different about this man who was Saul of Tarsus, that God has done an amazing thing in him. So after that, many days were fulfilled. The Jews took counsel to kill them. Kill him. Let me stop right here. I want you to understand when you start getting active about telling people about Jesus, when you start straightway going and telling people that Jesus is the Son of God, when you start telling people in this world that there's no hope for them outside of Jesus, that if they die without being saved, there's an eternal place called hell that they go to. And when you start to tell people that they're sinners and they're wicked and evil in the sight of God, uh, people aren't going to be happy with you. And the same thing happened to Saul, and as he started to become more effective, and as he started to, to win people to Jesus, the Jews hated him, and they took counsel to kill him. But their lying awake was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night, led him down the, by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. <clears throat> Stop right there. If you have been known in your community, you've been known in your family, you've been known in your sphere of influence as somebody who's antagonistic toward the church, who hates the church, if you've been antagonistic towards the church, and if you've been one of those people who have mocked Christians at your workplace or at school, you made fun of them, I want you to know that when you do get saved, they're going to be leery of you. I want you to understand that's a normal thing. It's a natural thing. They're going to be a little bit leery. Did you really get it or did you not get it? The ones you've got to worry about are not those initial ones that wonder about you and worry about you or think something's wrong with you. It's those people that call themselves Christians that think you're weird when you start telling them about Jesus. Amen? Because there's a lot of people who call themselves Christians in this world who are anything but. So Saul, when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he said to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And when he was with them coming in and out of Jerusalem, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. I want you to realize that it's put in there several times that the people did not want to hear the gospel of Jesus. Right. And in our generation, people don't want to hear it. They don't want to, even among church people, they don't really want to hear it in our generation. But we are still to be proclaimers of the truth. If you're with me, say I am. Amen. Now I want you to know today we're going to take this scripture and use it as a springboard. And we are going to look at some other scriptures, obviously. But we're going to talk about keeping moving forward. We're going to follow and cover three things, and this is what I want you to know. You're going to learn how to be a faithful servant. If you're going to go forward, you've got to be faithful. All of us want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But you will never hear those words if you are not good. And if you are not faithful in being a servant, a dual loss, one who is surrendered to slavery to a master, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. The second thing is you've got to firmly stand. You will not hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, if you are not firmly standing upon the truths of God's word and upon Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone, who is the rock of our salvation. You also need to be fulfilled servants. What does that mean? You're going to learn what that means a little bit. But I want you to know right from the get-go, Jesus is sufficient for us. We don't look for fulfillment outside of Jesus to get us motivated to do the work of God. Jesus is sufficient. Think about this. He loved you so much that he became your sin on the cross. He died for you, went to a grave, and rose again the third day for you. He spoke to you and told you you were a sinner, did he not? The Holy Spirit of God condemned you, convicted you, and then when you cried out for mercy, he saved your wretched soul. And we should be fulfilled in that. That's good enough. Nobody should come and have gimmicks to make you go tell people about Jesus. We don't need to have gimmicks and give out prizes for the one who tells the most people about Jesus. That's worldly stuff. Amen. There's your reward. I'd rather get a reward from Jesus when I get to heaven 
than to get some gift card to a restaurant. How about you? Amen. So let's look at this. The faithful servants, look at the examples we're given. First of all, were the disciples. Now these disciples, we're not, we're not talking about the 12 disciples. As we see a little later, he, when he came to those 12 disciples, they were a little leery of him because he had been about killing people and they weren't sure he was a disciple. We're talking about the disciples back in about chapter uh, 9, verse 23, 24, that let him down the wall by a basket. You see, those disciples were people that saw the change in old Saul. They were the people that heard Saul preach and learned from Paul or Saul. I'm going to mess that up all day. Y'all just get used to it. <laughs> but they let Saul down out of prison, let him down out of the wall to keep him from being killed. They put him in a basket and lowered down that rope. And not only that, they were afraid, no doubt. No doubt they would be afraid because if they got caught doing this, it could mean that they were in prison. It could even mean they'd be punished or put to death. And so they may have had some, some fear in being obedient. By the way, when we're talking about being faithful servants, that's the number one thing that keeps us from being both faithful and being a servant. It's fear. It's the fear of what other people think. It's the fear of being uh, found out that you're not all that. By the way, if you look around this room, you're going to find out that none of us are all that in this room. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. All of us in this room have sinned. If you say you have no sin, the truth's not in you. You're a liar to begin with. Therefore, you can't be a faithful servant. But you and I need to stop and understand this great concept today. We are saved by grace. We're kept by grace. And by the good grace of God, one day we're going to get out of this world and get to heaven. With that being in mind, we need to understand we've been given the grace of God. And the grace of God needs to overcome the fear of man. The grace of God needs to overcome the fear of rejection. The grace of God needs to overcome the fear of what other men will do unto you. By the way, the only thing they can do is harm the body or kill the body. They cannot touch your soul. And I thank God for that. Is everybody with me? So if you look at these disciples, look at it very carefully, verse 23. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their lying away was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. So Saul was a prisoner of fear. Not necessarily a prisoner like he's going to be in the future. He was not cast into a dungeon here, but he is in a prison of fear. People were surrounding him to kill him. If you and I would stop and understand this, you're already a prisoner in this world. You're not going to get out till Jesus says you get out. There's no parole for this prison of the world until Jesus says you're done. So while you're here in this prison of the world, why don't you tell the other prisoners how they can get out and how they can escape? Come on. We need to tell people about him. Now notice this, if you will, verse number 24, or 25, excuse me. Then the disciples took him by, what's that word? By night. Do you see the show of, of, of what they did was by night was because they in themselves had fear of what might happen. No doubt they were afraid that Paul would be discovered and that he would be killed. No doubt they were afraid they may be discovered and they could be, uh, be killed. I want you to understand this. Even though we are prisoners in this world until God releases us and takes us home. We have no need to fear inside of these prison walls. Why? Because you are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. You have already overcome the world through Jesus. You are already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are more than a conqueror. You are a victor in Jesus Christ. We need to stop fearing man. We need to stop fearing what people think and what people say. And it's time to stand up and be bold in your, your belief system. Amen. By the way, our belief system is not a Baptist belief system or a Methodist belief system. Our belief system is a Bible belief system. Amen. 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 Now watch this. They had already seen a difference. Look back at verse number 20 to 22. Look at this very carefully. Straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. Even though Paul knew that the vast majority of those people that were listening to him did not want to hear the message, he still yet spoke the message. You and I need to come to this conclusion, we are already dead. You're already dead. We are dead men walking. 
And a dead man is not afraid of anybody. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, I die daily. And I would imagine it's something he learned early in his Christian walk. And we see the evidence of it right here. Even though everybody was against him, he still yet was faithful in his preaching. Verse 21. All that heard him were amazed. By the way, whether people accept the gospel when you proclaim it, or whether they reject the gospel when you proclaim it, is totally irrelevant. The results are up to God, not up to you. Look up here, y'all. When you put a track in your envelope and mail it off, when you knock on a neighbor's door, give them a, a track, give them the gospel, you invite them to church, and you explain to them about Jesus. When you talk to that co-worker, or you sit across the table at lunch, or, or however it may be, or you kids at school, whenever you're trying to tell somebody about Jesus, I want you to understand that first and foremost, it's going to make an impact in their life. The Word of God never goes out void. It never goes out void. When you are preaching the truth about Jesus, now don't give them your opinion, and don't give them religion. Don't tell them if they start coming to church, they'll be better people. I found this to be true. You get people who aren't real good people, they start coming to church, they turn into even worse people. <laughs> what you need to tell them is that Jesus saves them. We don't need any more church people. We need saved people. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everybody with me? So they already seen a difference in Saul. And they saw that no matter the outcome, no matter whether he was rejected or whether his message was accepted, he kept on preaching the truth. And then we see in verse number uh, number 23, uh, 22, excuse me, Saul increased the more in strength. Now he's not talking about physical strength. He's talking about, I'm sure there is an element to it, since the Lord had struck him blind, and he's recovered from that. But I think there is an element to this, is spiritual strength. The more you tell people about Jesus, let's be real honest, you don't have to raise your hand today, but I'm just going to ask you a question. If you're in this room today and you are scared to death to open your mouth and tell somebody about Jesus, you don't have to raise your hand, raise it in your heart. But you know that's you. If you're here today and you say, well, Pastor Paul, I, I'm just, I'm too afraid. I don't know what to say. I, I don't know that I know enough to tell anybody. Well, let me tell you how you get over that. You suck it up, buttercup. When you open your mouth, you tell somebody about Jesus. And then when they ask you a question, if you don't know the answer, you go find the answer and give them the answer. Then the next person, when you tell them about Jesus, you're going to find out they're going to ask you probably the same question. And you're going to have the answer. And you're going to start being more confident and more confident and more confident. The more you tell people about Jesus, the more you want to tell people about Jesus. The more you want to tell people about Jesus, the more confident you become in telling people about Jesus. And we're supposed to go into the world and make an impact. But I'm afraid the world has impacted us instead of us impacting the world. Now look at this. Look at Barnabas. You talk about somebody that took a chance on Saul of Tarsus was Barnabas. Now why did I put Barnabas in here with faithful servants? Because he demonstrates what a faithful servant is. He believed God. God told him all about, the, all about this Saul. And he comes and he, he does exactly what God says. And he takes Saul under his wing. He teaches him. He leads him. He guides him. He helps him. He's his friend. My friend, I want you to know something. You're not a lone ranger in the church. Amen. There's too many people that are lone rangers in the church. Well, nobody wants to hear my problems. No, you might be surprised. There's a lot of people who want to hear about your problems. Some people want to hear about it because it's good gossip. <laughs> but there are other people that want to hear about your problems because they actually care about you. There are other people that will actually pray for you. They will actually love you. If, if you don't have any friends in church, then it's because you haven't shown yourself friendly. Yes, right. Because I'm here to tell you we're a family, and it sticks closer than our own earthly family. I'll tell you that right now. And I want you to know something. We need to be Barnabases. If you have been saved any time at all, you need to take somebody that's freshly saved, and you need to encourage them. You never know when they may be the next preacher. But look at old Barnabas. He took him, he brought him, and he declared to the apostles. Look what he did. He took him under his way. And then not only did he take him, he brought him to the disciples. He brought him. Do you realize that a lot of brand new baby Christians get frustrated really quickly and drop out of church? 
They need a Barnabas in their life. Amen. They need somebody that's going to take them under their wing. They need somebody that's going to bring them to church with them. They don't know everything just because they got saved. They're still babies in Christ. They need somebody to give them a bottle. They need somebody to change their diaper. They need somebody to help them when they are crying, when they're weak, and when they're down. Right. Then you can declare to the apostles, you can declare to the rest of the church, I've seen this brother, I've seen this sister, I've watched them grow. They're solid, and I can recommend them for any job in this church. Amen. Hallelujah. We're talking about faithful servants. Barnabas had been communing with the Lord. Now look up here. You're not going to be a faithful servant if you ain't communing with the Lord. Amen. You see, the Lord told Barnabas what to do, and the Lord will tell you what to do. Amen. How many of y'all, you can raise your hand, because I've had this happen to me several times. You'll be someplace just minding your own business, and all of a sudden you just feel that nudge inside, like the Holy Spirit wants you to go and tell somebody about Jesus. Amen. How many of y'all have been faithful all the time in that? Amen. Well, I thought. Yeah. You see, I failed in that. Mm -hmm. I never will forget one day. I was I was at Walmart. I've told you all this probably before. But I was at Walmart and, and I'm getting stuff for the church and uh, I'm coming back. It's it's time for you to go home and eat something or something, probably. <laughs> so I'm coming through the, the line at, at Walmart and there's this one guy standing out at the end of the aisle. You know how they stand out there. Do you want to go through my line? At least they used to. You don't see that very much anymore. Now most of y'all work for Walmart. You go through the checkout line yourself and pay for yeah. it. <laughs> but that man was standing there. I can still see where he was standing. I can still see his face. And the Lord spoke to my heart. Now God don't speak to me with an audible voice. It's louder than that. He spoke to my heart. This man looked dejected. He looked downcast. And I, I, I feel in my heart that the Lord wanted me to go over and tell him about Jesus. But in my mind, I started that whole gymnastics routine. Well, I don't have enough time. I'm on church business. I, I got to get this done. I got something else going on. He probably won't listen anyway. He probably isn't interested anyway. But the Holy Spirit of God laid on my heart to go over and tell that man. I went through another line and went out of there. I got down to about Avante, whatever it's called now. And it hit me. I need to go back and tell that man about Jesus. And then I started another gymnastics. I'm, on my, I'm already left. He's probably busy. In, right? Yeah. I get all the way back to the church. And I take all the stuff. I was in such a hurry to get out. And I brought it in here and put it away. And then it hit me again. So I finally said, all right, Lord, I'll be obedient. And I went back to Walmart. And I've never seen that man back there in, again. Yeah. I've never, when I got back there, he wasn't working. I thought, well, I'll go another day. I went several times, other days. I never saw that man again working at Walmart. I was disobedient to God, and to this day, that's been 15 years ago, and to this day I can still see his face, and I know that I did not listen to the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. I was not a Barnabas. Wow. I was not faithful. I was not good. And to be honest, for that one thing, and there are many others I'm afraid to tell you in my life, for that thing, I deserve to never hear well done, thou good and faithful servant, because I'm not good and I was not faithful. Amen. Are y'all listening to me? Yeah. We need to be Barnabas. We need to be communing with the Lord. You know something? If you want to tell somebody about Jesus, you want the strength to tell somebody about Jesus, then you go to the Lord and you say, Lord, I need you to help me. And I'm here to tell you, God will help you. He will lead you. Oh, don't be stupid and go, hey, Lord, show me somebody today I need to talk to. If you're not ready for the Lord to show you somebody to talk to. Because, oh, yes, he will. You see, the field's wide on the harvest. But the laborers are few. There are people out there in this world, and you start doing those gymnastics in your mind, they probably don't want to hear anyone. But I'm here to tell you there are lots of people in this world that want to hear the truth. You may talk to 10 people, and out of 10 people, there may only be one. You may talk to 100 people. Out of that 100 people, there may only be one. You may talk to 1,000 or 10,000, and out of all of them, there may only be one. But that one is enough. Amen. Amen. You're here, and you're saved. 
because somebody opened their mouth and told you. Amen. And you're here today, and those of you that are serving in this church, you're here and you're serving because somebody was a Barnabas to you. Somebody overlooked your infancy in Christ, and they helped you to grow, didn't they? And they showed you, oh, yes, you can. You can do it. And God's grace, by God's strength, you can do anything. By the way, the Bible still says I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengthens me. Amen. Anything about God, our God's faithful, isn't he? Now, this is part one. Part two is next Sunday. This is part one, to be a faithful servant. God is faithful. I am so thankful today that my God is faithful. My God was faithful. My God is faithful. My God will always be faithful. He has never failed me. He has never let me down, even if I perceive that he has. Right. Even if I think or feel that he has. We're not to walk by thinking or feeling. We walk by faith. Right. And my God has never failed me. And God didn't fail Saul. God didn't fail Barnabas. God didn't fail those disciples. But might I remind you that some of these disciples that we're reading about that let Saul down out of the, uh, the, the wall by the basket. Might I remind you that in a few years they're going to be kicked out of Jerusalem altogether. Might I remind you that in a couple of years, some of these people, many of these, as a matter of fact, the vast majority of these believers in Jerusalem, in these cities, are going to be slaughtered wholesale. They're going to be sawn asunder. They're going to be beheaded. They're going to be killed. They're going to be driven out from their homes. All of their property is going to be seized. They're going to live destitute in caves and in mountains. All because of Jesus and their love. And yet my God never failed them one time. My God never failed them. Have you ever read in the book of Hebrews? Now we're in Hebrews chapter number 11. It's the faith chapter. And it talks about those who were slaughtered for the cause of Christ. And it says the world was not worthy of them. Now look up here. If you want to be a faithful servant of Jesus... You're going to have to model what these disciples did. You're going to have to overcome some fear. You have to stop and realize that the fears that are in your head are unsubstantiated. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. As scared as you are to tell people about Jesus, the world is afraid to hear the truth. <laughs> you need to overcome the fear. And you need to realize that the grace of God should overcome that fear. Because somebody told a wretch like me, an undesirable, ungodly, wicked, vile, sinful wretch like me, and somebody told me. And I got saved. And somebody told a wretch like you. And you got saved. Hello. I'm so thankful for the ones who weren't afraid. We gotta be like farmers. We need to call ourselves into accountability. And we need to yield ourselves into that role. But I want you to see a couple of verses about the faithfulness of God. Y'all still with me? Amen. The Lord is what? Amen. Hey, the Bible says God's faithful. That's good enough for me. Amen. The Lord is faithful. Who shall? Look at that word, establish. Now we use the, we put an E in front of it now to establish you, but the word establish is a little bit different than establish. The word establish means to stabilize, to help you stand firm and strong. It is God that will help you stand firm. I'm here to tell you that men and women will leave you, they will run away from you, they will abandon you. But God never leaves. He'll never forsake you. He'll never leave you. And in the time of trouble, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. This is Jesus we're talking about. Not only will he establish you, but he will keep you from evil. Do you realize that when we stop and we desire to be a faithful servant, it starts with our will and our desire to want to yield ourselves to the lordship and the leadership of God. And when we desire to do that, I want you to know the Lord's faithful. He's going to establish you. But it's going to be a process of establishing you. You're not established overnight. 
There's not a single man who's ever gone into combat that got up from high school, finished a test, went out, put on combat boots, and rode into a battle. There's a process of learning, a process of transformation, and a process of growth. You go to boot camp where they take the civilian out of you, replace your mindset with a military mindset. Right. And after the military mindset, then you go to being trained on how to use that military mindset. Yeah. And after you are trained to use that military mindset, then they use you to execute what you've learned. Right. Everybody with me? Yeah. The same thing is for you and I as Christians. When we first get saved, we're babies. We have to learn. We grow. We make messes. We make mistakes. Yeah. Aren't you glad God doesn't throw the baby out of the bathwater? Yeah. He allows you to grow. It's God that's working in you. It's God that's establishing you. And then when God gets you to that place where you are established, He's going to keep you from evil. When you are a faithful servant, you will find out exactly what that means. 1 Corinthians 1 9. God is faithful. By whom you are called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. There ain't nobody in this room when looking for Jesus. Nobody. But it was God that saved somebody and put it on their heart. That other people without Jesus is going to die and go to hell. And they came to you. And told you about the truth. And then God convicted you of sin. God convicted you. And then oh praise God. When you responded he saved you. Didn't he? Everybody with me? God's faithful. Faithful is he that calleth you. Listen to me. I want you to understand this. I am not a Calvinist, nor am I an Arminianist. I am a Biblicist. And I'm here to tell you that God calls us to repentance. Amen. And when God calls us, it is because God is faithful. Every morning when you get up and you walk outside of your house and the sun comes up over that mountain, it is God showing you how faithful He is to you and how faithful he is to his word. Amen. That sun's going to come up on that mountain. And it's going to go down over those mountains. And it's going to happen every day until Jesus calls you home. Amen. It's God's faithfulness. And he demonstrates his faithfulness every day if you just look at the natural world. You still with me? Now let's talk about us and we're done with this part of the message. We can be faithful. How many of you believe we can actually be faithful? None of you. Very good. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord, they're proud. <laughs> what does the word... <laughs> Y'all are thinking too hard up there. What does the word faithful mean? Listen to me. Let's break this down. Faith is the word pistis. And it means that which is based upon fact. Full on the end has the idea of completion. So I want you to understand this. We can be faithful because we have the facts that show us the truth of all things to the end. Amen. Nothing should catch you by surprise that's happening in this world. And to be honest, Christian, if you're in the Bible, Nothing's going to catch you by surprise when the devil comes and the enemy comes to try to get you to fall. That's right. Right. Amen. Remember what we started out with at the very beginning? The devil would like nothing more than to destroy you. Yeah. You can be found faithful. If you base your life upon the facts of this word until it is complete. He that began a work in you will see it through right. to completion. Right. It is God that works in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. 
You are bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus. Therefore, glorify God in your body, in your soul. We are to love God with all our soul, heart, mind, strength, are we not? When you do these things and put this faith into action, you will be found faithful. Watch this. I like this. Old John said, I have no greater joy. And I can agree with this 100%. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou dost faithfully whatsoever thou dost to the brethren and to strangers. You want to know the greatest thing a pastor can ever hear? A pastor does not, honestly, listen to me very carefully, a real pastor. I'm not talking about one of these professional clergy people. I'm talking about a real pastor. You can tell a real pastor, you can meet, greet me out the door, shake my hand, whatever, say that, that was a good message. But that doesn't mean anything. doesn't mean anything. When I am gone, whether the Lord leads me away or I retire or I stroke out and can't talk no more, whatever. What I want to see is what you are when I'm gone. What I want to see is how the words that God has allowed me to preach impacted your life when I'm nowhere to be found in your life. And it would bring me no greater joy than to hear that Shenmue Heights Baptist Church is walking in truth when I'm gone. That's the difference. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Let me ask you, you can raise your hand. How many want to hear when they get to heaven? By the way, listen to me. You're going to be going along one day in your world. And all of a sudden, you're not going to be here anymore. You're going to die. You may have a disease and die. You may have a car accident and die. You may have some tragic event happen in your life and you die. You may be old and you just die of old age. You may go to sleep and never wake up, but you're going to die. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. For the lost world, they're going to stand before the great white throne. You and I who are saved, we don't have to fear the great white throne. That was taken care of in the blood of Christ. But we have to give an account to God. I desperately, and I don't think I will ever hear it, but I would desperately want to hear Well done, son. You've been a good and faithful servant. You were a dipstick, but you did the best. <laughs> That's what I want to hear from Jesus. But if we haven't been good, and we haven't been faithful, and if we are not truly a servant, we're not going to hear well done. But I want to hear well done. How about you? You know why? And it's kind of selfish, but it's a biblical selfishness. Look at that verse. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over a whole bunch. Right. Right. i got to be honest. There's a spiritual side to this. I want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, because I deserve hell, and my God saved me, and I want to glorify Jesus with my life. I fail him all the time. I mean all the time. And there's a spiritual side, but there's a selfish side. I want to, I really, in millennial reign, I want to kick people in the teeth and just don't want to listen to Jesus. Now, he's going to rule with a rod of iron. means he's going to beat people. <laughs> Look up here. Do you want to hear well done? But don't take that the wrong way. I don't want to kick you by the teeth. I want to do it the right way. I go to jail now. <laughs> Got to pay fines and all that stuff. Lose your testimony and everything, right? Come on, y'all. You know what I'm talking about. But do you love Jesus enough to, stay, to say, my life really doesn't matter? 
I need to die to myself. I ain't all that. Oh, God, help me. I want to hear well done. That good and faithful servant. Let's all stand this morning. Part two and three we'll have next week. Which is standing firm and being fulfilled. Daniel, what number are we singing, brother? Number 315. Listen, the altar's open for you. If the Lord spoke to your heart, you're more than welcome to come to an old-fashioned altar.